Hello, my name is Mick Petzold. Welcome to this presentation of K. Mani Chandi, Jayadev Misra, and Laura M. Haas's paper on distributed deadlock detection. I'll be providing an introduction that addresses a deadlock problem, then providing an in-depth look at deadlock models and Chandri, Misra, and Haas's proposed distributed deadlock detection techniques, including their algorithms. And finally, concluding with some performance numbers and uh, overall summary on whether they met their goals. Chandri, Misra, and Haas's paper assumes a thorough knowledge of deadlocks. Um, I believe it's important to first take a little time to gain a basic understanding of what a deadlock is. This section introduces a deadlock problem and addresses the conditions for them to occur, how they are graphed, the strategies used to handle them, an explanation on distributed, and the different types of deadlock models. With this knowledge, we can better understand the deadlock problems this paper addresses and Chandri Mizra and Haas's well-received solution. The deadlock problem. A deadlock is a situation where processes in a system of processes get blocked indefinitely from functioning because one of the processes, which we'll call the initial process, is waiting for a resource being used by another process that itself is waiting for a resource either held by the initial process or another process in a wait state, eventually with one process in the chain waiting for a resource held by the initial process. That's difficult to visualize. So let's look at a simple example and create a deadlock dependency graph. Assume two processes and two resources. Process P1 holds or is allocated resource R1. It also needs resource R2 to run so it sends a request for R2 and enters a wait state until it gets allocated both resources it needs to run. However, resource R2 is held by process P2, which also needs resource R1 held by process P1. It requests resource R1 and also enters a wait state until it gets allocated all resources it needs to run. In effect, process P1 is waiting for process P2 to run and give up resource R2, and process P2 is waiting for process P1 to run and give up resource R1. We have a deadlock since neither process can exit their wait state to run. Deadlock conditions. From the previous example, in definition of a deadlock, we can see there are four conditions needed for a deadlock to exist. First, resources can only be used by one process at a time. This is called mutual exclusion. Second, there must be an idle process that is holding at least one resource and waiting for at least one other. This is called the hold and wait condition. Third, a process cannot be taken away from another process or else one of the processes can break a potential dead block uh, deadlock by taking a resource away from another process it was allocated to this condition is called no exemption fourth um, there must be a circular dependency in our graph this is called a circular weight condition and is often called a cycle if all four exist, we have a deadlock. All right, let's talk a little bit about graph models. The first figure shows an example of a resource allocation graph, the same type we showed in our simple example. In this case, P1 holds R1 and requests R2, which is held by P2. P2 requests R3, which in turn is held by P3. Finally, P3 requests R1, held by P1, completing our circular wait. All processes are idle, waiting on another to run before it can begin. This is a deadlock. Also notice that the resource allocation graph is similar to the 
or the deadlock dependency graph as introduced in our lecture six notes, where the processes are considered thread vertices and resources lock vertices. Uh, let's look at the uh, wait for graph, which is an easier way to show the same thing. In this graph, the processes are considered nodes. The arrows indicating pending requests or assignments are considered edges. This graph simply reads P1 is waiting for P2, which in turn is waiting for P3, which is waiting for P1. Again, this completes a cycle or circular wait and demonstrates the same deadlock as before. So there are four strategies to handle deadlocks. The first one, ignorance, or just plain ignoring deadlocks, is obviously not a good approach. However, it is an approach that apparently was not uncommon. Avoidance means properly allocating resource to ensure there is an execution sequence that allows all processes to run to completion. Prevention means the use of a technique that prevents one of the four conditions from occurring, thereby preventing a deadlock, such as restraining requests until all resources are available, and then acquire them simultaneously, which breaks the hold and wait condition. And finally, detection means allowing a deadlock to occur, and when it does, find it and break it. Centralized versus distributed systems. In a centralized system, it has a single central agent that has complete information about every process. This type of system can manage resource allocation and easily determine whether there are any deadlocks. In a distributed system, we have a network of computers typically, each with processes with no single central agents. Deadlocks are similar to centralized system deadlocks, but they cannot be avoided. There is no central agent, so prevention of deadlocks is also difficult due to processes and resources being distributed. Because of this, detection is the best strategy to handle deadlocks in a distributed system. Chandy Mishra Haas's algorithms handle two models both the resource model and the communication model. In the resource model, processes that request resources must wait until it is allocated all resources it requested before it can begin computation. For example, if a process needs resources A, B, and C, it must wait until it receives all three resources. Deadlocks can occur when processes wait indefinitely for resources held by each other. This means resource requests use the AND condition exclusively. In the communication model, processes must wait to communicate with other processes until receipt of communication. Deadlocks can occur when each process is waiting to communicate with another process and no process can begin until it receives the communication for which it is waiting. Communication requests use the and and or conditions for resource requests. So let's talk about and and or conditions. In an and condition, a process or transaction remains idle until it receives all the resources it requires. The resource model, as stated before, uses and conditions only as it must wait for all resources in order to execute. In an OR condition, a transaction remains idle until it receives communication granting any one of the requested resources, which is typical in the communication model. The communication model is subject to arbitrary requests involving both AND and OR. For example, a process may require resource A and either resource B or resource C. If A is received first, it waits for either B or C, canceling the other once one is received. If B or C is received first, it cancels the other and waits for A. 
So in their paper, Chandy, Misra, and Haas provided a distributed deadlock detection solution. Um, and this is the list of uh, requirements that and issues that they're looking to solve um, in their implementation. The solution must provide deadlock detection algorithms for distributed systems. It must handle both resource and communication deadlocks. The algorithm must be simple. All true deadlocks must be detected and no false deadlocks reported. Must have minimal effect on process speed, so must use standard minimal messaging. And finally, it must also detect a deadlock when any subset of processes waits for each other. In this section, we'll deal mainly with the resource model. I'll touch briefly on the communication model, but we'll not go in the same depth as the resource model discussion. Distributed computation model. Chandy, Misra, and Haas define a network as consisting of a set of processes that communicate with each other using messages. Network processes are in one of two states, either executing or idle. In the executing state, processes may change state to idle at any time. In the idle state, they may change state to executing only after requests have been allocated. Sender P sub I must be in executing state to send a message to P sub J. There is no wait to send a message. Um, that is, P I doesn't have to wait for P J to indicate ready to receive a message. P J must wait for acknowledgement of receipt from P J from performing its computation. Messages are received by P J using first in, first out. Um, FIFO, which requires sequence numbers and periodic process polls for incoming messages. The receiver must send an acknowledgement to indicate receipt. We'll talk about the resource model. Chandy, Misra, and Haas study a distributed database of N computers, S1 to SN, running M transactions, T1 to TM. Each computer has resources, a controller managing a set of resources, scheduling constituent processes and carrying out communication. And it has processes that can only request resources from its own controller. Transactions are implemented by a collection of processes with at most one per computer. A process gets labeled with a tuple P sub IJ, where TI is the transaction and SJ is a computer where process runs. So an example follows. Here is an example of a distributed database network with N computers, S1 to SN, each with a controller, C1 to CN, controlling the constituent processes on that computer. A process P sub I1 located on computer S1 requires a resource. P sub I1 sends a request to its controller C1. If C1 manages a resource and the resource is not available, that is if another process in, S, in S1 is holding it, then P sub I1 waits and enters idle state. If C1 manages a resource and it's available, C1 allocates the resource immediately. This is a local transaction in that case. However, if the resource is managed by another controller, 
let's say C3, then C1 transmits the request to process P sub I3 via C3. P sub I3 then requests the resource from its controller C3. When P sub I3 acquires a resource from C3, it sends a message back to P sub I1 via C3 and C1 acknowledging allocation of resource. Um, remember that P sub I1 cannot proceed with its computation unless it has received all requested resources. When P sub I1 no longer needs the resource managed by C3, it communicates with process P sub I3 via C3. P sub I3 then releases the resource to C3. So here's the resource model example in the uh, wait for graph format. For simplicity, we can rewrite the prior model by assigning a single subscript to a process rather than the tuple used before using the wait for graph approach and refer, referring to controllers and transactions explicitly. The prior example before allocation of the resources held by P sub I3, so now P14, is shown here where process P sub I1 now P2 is simply waiting for P14. PJ is dependent on PK. If a sequence of PJ, P sub I1 to P sub I M, and finally PK exists where each process is idle, and the subsequent process is holding a resource for the preceding one. In this example, we have two sequences, P2, P14, P8, P7, P3, where P2 is dependent on P3. And then the second one is P12, P11, P9, P14, where P12 is locally dependent on P14 locally since all processes belong to the same controller. Now let's assume P3 is waiting for P2. Notice we now have a circular wait or a cycle. P2 becomes deadlocked because it is now dependent on itself. In fact, all processes in that sequence become dependent on themselves and all are therefore deadlocked. In addition, P12 is also deadlocked because it is dependent on a process that is dependent on itself. In a resource model, the goal of a distributed deadlock detection system is to declare the existence of a deadlock if and only if such cycles exist. All right, let's talk about the communication model. There's several differences between the communication model and the resource model. In a communication model, requests for resource allocation, cancellation, and release is implemented by messages. A process initially knows the identity of processes it must receive a message from. A process can run if it can communicate with at least one of the processes for which it is waiting. And that's the or condition versus and condition. A deadlock in the communications model is indicated by a knot of waiting processes as opposed to a circular wait or a cycle. As mentioned before, the communication model can handle logic combinations such as resource A and either resource B or resource C. And finally, a set of processes S is deadlocked if and only if all processes in S are idle. The dependent set of every process in S is a subset of S, 
and there are no messages in transit between processes and S. Here I'm going to focus mainly on resource model distributed deadlock detection technique. Um, the reason is to adequately explain the communication model deadlock detection. And it's going to take me more than an hour. So I will touch briefly on it, but I won't get into detail on the communication model. In resource model deadlock detection, it begins with the probe computation being initiated on an idle process. Probe IJK means that it is initiated by process PI. It will be sent from PJ on one controller to PK on another. If PJ is idle, PJ is waiting for PK, and PI is dependent on PJ. PK will accept it if PK is idle, and PK did not know that PI was dependent on it. It's easy to see that if PI accepts a probe IJI, then PI is deadlocked. So let's talk about Chandy, Misra, and Haas's resource model algorithm. Each controller maintains a Boolean array dependent for each constituent process PK, where the array variable dependent K of I is true only if PK's controller knows that PI is dependent on PK. If the array variable dependent sub J of I is true, then PI is dependent on itself and PI is therefore deadlocked. Initial array variable dependent IJ is set false for all I and J. This is Chandy, Misra, and Haas's resource model algorithm for sending a probe for a constituent idle process PI. If PI is locally dependent on itself, that is, if PI belongs to a deadlock set of processes all on the same controller, then declare deadlock. Else for all of PA, PB, where PI is locally dependent upon PA, and PA is waiting on PB, and PA and PB have different controllers, send probe IAB. And this piece of the algorithm is um, pseudocode for receiving probe IJK. If PK is idle, if dependent KI is false, and PK has not replied positively to all requests, uh, PJ, then dependent KI is true. If K is equal to I, then in that case, of course, declare that PI is deadlocked. Else for all PA, PB, where PK is locally dependent upon PA, PA is waiting on PB and PA and PB have different controllers again send another probe, IAB. So if we detect the deadlock, we can now tell all processes waiting for the deadlock process that they are also deadlocked. And finally, this is the algorithm for indicating a process is executing and not deadlocked. Set Dependent K, I falls for all of I. This is the previous example 
resource model example deadlock that we use to show a distributed deadlock. Uh, let's use it to show how Chandi Misran Haas's algorithm works. Probe computation will be initiated by the S1 controller on the idle process P3. P3 is locally dependent on P2, and P2 is waiting for P14. P2 and P14 are on different sites, so probe 3 to 14 is sent to the S3 controller. The S3 controller receives probe 3 to 14 and determines that P14 is idle. The array variable dependent 14, 3, element 3 is false, and P14 has not allocated requested resource to P2. The controller then sends sets dependent 14, 3 to true. Since I does not equal K, and P14 is locally dependent on P13, and P13 is waiting for P8, the S3 controller now sends probe 313.8 to S2's controller. The S2 controller receives probe 313.8 and determines that P8 is idle, dependent 83 is false, and P8 has not allocated requested resource to P13. So the controller then sets dependent um, eight element three to true since I does not equal K and P8 is locally dependent on P7 and P7 is waiting for P3. S2's controller sends probe 373 to S1's controller. S1's controller receives probe 373 and determines that P3 is idle. Dependent 3, 3 is false, and P3 has not allocated the requested resource to P7. The controller then sets P3, 3 to true. Since I now equals K, the controller declares that process. P3 is deadlocked. The communication model deadlock detection technique. Um, there's two types of messages, queries and replies. An idle process determines whether it is deadlocked by initiating a query computation. Messages are in the form of query IMJK and reply IMJK, where M is the sequence number indicating the mth query, I indicates the initiation initiating process PI, and J and K are the sender process PJ and receiver process PK, respectively. So there's two properties. If PI is deadlocked when it initiates the nth query, it will receive a reply IMJK corresponding to every query IMJK that it sent. And conversely, if PI has received a reply IMJK, corresponding to every query IMJK that it's sent, it is deadlocked. And in conclusion, performance, the number of required messages in a resource model deadlock that spans M processes over N computers is M times N minus one over two. In our preceding example, we see that it had 15 processes times three computers minus one divided by two, which is only 15 messages. Each message is only three words long. 
Chandi, Mishra, and Haas presented distributed deadlock models for both resource and communication deadlocks in their paper. Their simple algorithms did result in all true deadlocks being detected and no false deadlocks occurring. Their solution required a minimal number of messages and all messages had identical short lengths. Their successful solution can be applied in distributed databases and other message communication systems. And finally, thank you for listening to my presentation. And I hope you got a little bit of an understanding of distributed deadlock detection.